12. Okay, you didn't miss anything last week because I wasn't here. Sorry. My, it wasn't my fault. It was uh, the weather. Filling the ice box. I was not going to go in the ice box. Could I have a 58? Do an airplane. 58 what? Baron 58. I do have a Baron 58. And I got full of the icing, but no one in their right mind flies into freezing rain and freezing drizzle because you can't get it off an airplane. Matter of fact, there's no airliner out there that's going to be flying into that condition. Well, you hope not. Yeah. That's, that's scary stuff, dude. Freezing rain and freezing drizzle doesn't come off airplanes. Not until you get on the ground. You put some ethylene glycol at about 200 degrees C. And then it'll come off. Oh, anyway, we are, it, like I say, you didn't miss anything before. What I did with the class before that, because a lot of people weren't here, is I, I gave a freebie so we didn't go too far, so we're good. And I, and I put the same words of the day, but I won't go into quite as much detail because I really wanted to go into detail about the sacrificial thing of the Passover last time. So for this time, we'll just, we'll cover this quickly. P-A-S-C-H-A, Pasha. Pasha is the Paschal, and the word means, we, we tra we've translated this to be Paschal, the Paschal lamb, Pasha. It's Aramaic. This is a borrowed word in Greek. So um, basically it means this is the Passover, and the festivals with the special sacrifices for the Passover. So if you don't remember the Passover, go back and either review the class I taught on this before, or go back and look in... Um, was it Deuteronomy, Exodus, Deuteronomy about the Passover, but Jesus becomes the Passover, and we'll talk about that in detail. We talked about that kind of in detail a couple of weeks ago. Um, this is silent-ish, but Thuo, um, see, Ethuon, Thuo, Thuos, this word is a really neat word because if you remember Epithumia, which is one of my favorite words. Epithumia is the scent of the sacrifice. Epi means reaching out. Thumia is this word right here. Thuo. Thuo means, and I think I showed it here for you. Thuo means, it's, it, they've translated here to rush. Uh, close enough, but you see what I put in, in parentheses there? They also, in the Strong's or Vines, you'll see it says, breathe hard, blow, or smoke. So the thuo is the part of the epithumia that's the sac, that's the scent, that's the smoke, the scent. So thuo means to rush, but it means that scent. So I went into great detail a couple of weeks ago. Just remember this. If you only eat meat like the Greeks did about 12 times a year because you sacrificed it in the sacrifice, epithumia literally means, epithumia is a word that's translated to desire. It's more akin to lust in German, which means to desire something, not to, not lust. Sometimes it's translated in English lust, and that's incorrect. It means to desire something greatly. And so thuo is that part of the scent. That's the scent. So... When they smelled it, if you only ate meat 12, okay, imagine, you've not had meat for a month, and all of a sudden you, you hear the sizzling crackle on the grill, and you smell it, right? And your mouth starts, is Pavlo, right? Pavlov walks into a bar and, and hears his phone ring and says, oh, I forgot to feed the dogs. <laughs> so your mouth starts watering because you haven't had meat for a long time. That's Thuo. That's Thuo. I just heard it. That's an engineer's joke, right? Um, e S T R O M E N O N. S T R O M E N O N. Let's see what I put on here. Stro uh, Numi. Um, I went to great detail about this a couple of weeks ago, too. Very quickly. Um, those who've had the class can answer this easily, so go ahead. But. If you have, what was the furniture in a Greek culture? What kind of furniture did I have? Mats. Yeah, mats, see? There we go. That's all you had. You did, you know, we imagine, 
our furniture is tables and chairs, right? There's no, look, you see a movie in the ancient world and they got tables and chairs. No, not at all. Very rarely, there were some tables, very low tables. I talked about this before, but there were no chairs. People reclined to eat. And they reclined on mats and on pillows. So this word sounds like to strew, to strew, and it means that. So when you have a room that's fully furnished, it means it's filled with mats and filled with pillows. And so that to a Greek, and when a Greek person, to us, when we go into a room and we see leather furniture, right? We think, well, guys think it's a man cave. Women think, oh, it looks pretty cool, right? It's decorated. Mm -hmm. To the Greeks in the ancient world, if it's full of mats and things to lay on and to sit on, then it is a fully furnished room. This one, A-N-A-G-A-I-O-N, anagion, anagion, anagion means above the ground, and literally usually a second floor. I went to detail about this, what's on the first floor. We may talk about that, but what I want to do is I want to get into the text so that we can move along with this. I'm hoping to finish in the next semester at least. We may get uh, pretty far this semester, but we only have a couple weeks. Next week I won't be here because I'm going to be in Paris flying airplanes. So I'll be back for the next one. Um, and then I think I usually teach when they do the birthday party to Jesus. So if you want to go to the birthday party to Jesus, that's okay. But I usually teach a class then. But we'll see what how it works out. But next week I should be in Paris, God willing, um, or traveling to Paris. So. Uh, it's not fun. It's, it's aviation, so I'll be seeing hotel rooms and base ops and the inside of aircraft. Is, you know, so I don't know. That, it's fun for me, but I guess not for everybody else. Um, twelve. This is Mark fourteen twelve. So remember, we had um, before this. We had before this. We had the most the highest climax, the climax of Mark, because the climax of Mark, Mark asks the question. This is the question. This is the Logos of Mark. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And the first half of Mark to 8 tells us that Jesus is God. He is a, at least a God, but proves that he is God. So he is God. In 8, uh, Peter incorrectly answers the question, Who do you say that I am? And he says, and, and the author intended, intends this to be, but remember, Peter is the foeable. Peter is like in, the Greek, in a Greek dialogue. He's the guy, you know, uh, go look back at your Greek dialogues. If you don't remember them, I, I think I mentioned this a couple of times ago, but in a Greek dialogue, you always have somebody asking Socrates questions. Sometimes they're intelligent questions, and sometimes they're dumb questions. Unfortunately, Peter asks dumb questions a lot of times. I'm sorry, Peter, but we know this, right? And the Greeks get this. Peter is the foal. And so it's not a negative. He's not in a opposition to Christ or to Jesus. But he is the guy that asks the dumb questions, okay? The Greeks laugh at this because that's part of their culture. In their culture, they've already figured it out, right? They love irony. Greeks love irony. They love sarcasm. They love this, um, the wits, the logos to tell us. It's part of their culture. They love it. They want to know the, they want to have already figured out the telos before they get to the question. This is Greek. This is the way they think. Go look back at your dialogues and find it over and over again. And so when Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Every Greek reader of that text, well, hearer of the text, remember, they didn't read it the way we read it. It's mnemonics. So every Greek hearer goes, ha ha, he's God. And what does Peter say? You are the Christos. You're the Christ, the Christos. You're the anointed one, which is a whole different thing than the God, right? We also, the Christos, in, in, because of the apocryphal documents, this is out of the apocrypha, the Christos equals, in, in Hebrew thought, a thing called the Son of Man. 
And throughout the text, from then on, Jesus talks about the Son of Man. He never calls himself the Son of Man. When he's going through Jericho, a blind man, Bartholomew, Barth whatever his name is, anyway, Bartimaeus, he, he says, you are the Son of David. The Son of David is the King. Okay? Now, we have an event that happens that is the, that is the climax of all of Mark. The climax of the Gospel. And the climax of the Gospel, Jesus tells us is the climax of the Gospel, is when the woman anoints him. Because by anointing him, she just said that he is what? Which one of these? He is the king. He is also the... Christus means anointed one. He's the anointed one. Holy smoke. And if he's the anointed one, it means he's also... Well, the son of man. See? None of this proves, that doesn't prove he's God. The other part, you have whole, eight whole chapters that proved he was God, right? So the crisis of Matthew, or Mark, the, the climax of Mark from a literary standpoint is that last verse. And by the way, at the end of the last verse, Judas Iscariot in 10, 1 and 12 went to the high priest and told him he would not betray, he would perdidomai, he would surrender Jesus to them. They were delighted and they would give him silver. Okay? So, and we talked about that. Now, that is the setup. And remember, do not forget, we, this is a Logos to tell us. So everything that happened in chapter 1, 1 is what? Everything that's happened between there and 14 is what? Still going on. Still going on. Yeah, it, it hasn't <clears throat> ended. It's a Logos to tell us. In the Greek Logos to tell us, what they told us here is going to, it means something here. The Greeks expect you to remember. You say, well, I don't want to remember that much. These are people that memorize whole books, okay? So if, if they did it, you can do it anyway. That's what they expect us to do, so that's what we need to remember. It's probably a good thing to memorize this text anyway. I mean, people did that in the past. I haven't done it, so I'm not asking you to. I'm just saying that in understanding this, we have to go, we can't just look at the now. These aren't little pieces of stories. These are logos to tell us, a logical argument to a unstated conclusion that tell us. And so let's look and see what happens. 12, this is 14, 12. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is the Paschal, the Passover, when it was customary to thuo, to sacrifice, the scent, the sacrifice. And remember, I'll, I'll mention this. I'm sorry for those. This is a repeat. But there is a difference between... What's the difference between a holocaust... And this is not Greek. This is a Hebrew word. Holocaust, sacrifice, and a thuo, a rush sacrifice. Something that's called. Holocaust is completely burned. The holocaust is completely burned. That's right. So what does it smell like? <laughs> Take a boot and burn it and then smell it. Okay, that's what it smells like. Horrible, horrific, all right? But a sacrifice that is a rush sacrifice, because what did they do with the Passover? They ate it. They ate it. So what it's saying is, when they sacrificed it, the scent of the sacrifice, the smell of the roasting meat, okay? The Hebrews only ate meat six times a year, the average, okay? The rich people maybe ate it every day, I don't know. But the, the average people only ate six times a year because that's when the sacrifices occurred, right? The three pilgrim and three non-pilgrim sacrifices. Or oh. fish is separate. What's fish that? Fish is a different meat. Fish is a different meat. Fish is not a meat. By the way, the Pope also said that. That was back in uh, the 1400, or 1500s, I think. But but meat, uh, fish is not considered a meat. And um, it's not sacrificed. So you can eat fish all you want. Why do you think? What, what do you think? What's the difference between fish and meat that makes it a huge difference in the mind of the, of well, Christ. <clears throat> The blood for what? What's about the blood? <clears throat> when there's no blood in fish meat in the meat. Well, some, sometimes there is a little bit, but you're right. What you're getting at is exactly right. Remember, animals are warm-blooded, 
even even uh, birds are warm-blooded, which is interesting, right? Because they're kind of related to reptiles. But fish are cold-blooded. Yeah, the, yeah, I'm riding the comics too. Own a umpire or whatever, opia. Anyway, but fish are fish are are, are cold blooded, and isn't it interesting that ancient peoples perceive that? That in other words, the essence of life in the blood, the warm, the you know, the blood itself, to them meant life. And the reason uh, they had no idea about circulation or about anatomy or anything like that, but they just knew, for some reason, that that was an indicator, right, of life. So, very interesting. Anyway, so the thuo, the rush, the, the sacrifice, the eating, the food sacrifice of the Passover, the Pascha lamb. Jesus' disciples legoed him. Lego. Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Pascha, the Passover lamb? Okay. Here we go. Now, I want to note something. It says the disciples asked him. How many, we'll, we'll get an answer to this question pretty soon, but how many disciples are there? Who came with him through Jericho? What did it say? You can cheat by looking back if you want, but does anybody know the question, answer to that question? It said a multitude, a throng of people came with him. A throng of people came from Jericho. A throng of people came with him to Jerusalem. Where did they all come from? Who knows? The Galil. They came from the area of the ten cities, the, the Greek area. They came from all over. There was a throng that came with him through Jericho. There was a throng that came with him to Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus is encircled by a throng of people that are all his disciples. When it says the 12 disciples, it means there are 12 there. When it says generally disciples, remember, this is a logos to tell us. The Greek author intends you to remember Right? Just because he doesn't repeat it over and over again, the disciples happen to be a throng, right? That's your problem, not his. You see? In English, what would we do? We continue to do the scene setting. I write about this all the time. In English, you write scene setting. So in a scene setting, you always tell your reader who's there, right? That's what we do in English. We set the scene, we set the characters. But in Greek, that's not what you do. In Greek... They expect you to remember because it didn't change. Unless the actual, you know, everything, events change, they don't change it. So in other words, until Mark tells you, they all left. Ooh, we may, we may see that, right? Oh, anyway, let's see what happens. So, in 13, he sent, get this, he apostello. Apostello means to send. He apostello two of his disciples. Well, who are these guys? One of the twelve? Telling, Lego them, Lego them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will encounter you, not meet you, will apanteo, encounter you. Uh, follow him, literally go in the same way with him. All right, so what's the big deal here? Aren't there men always carrying jars of water around? No. no. Why? No women. No women. Yeah. Okay, in us, in our in our culture, we don't care if a man or a woman's carrying a jar, right? But in their culture, women generally carry jars, carry water. That's one of the I don't know if you say it's domestic duties, it's one of the duties that is done in you know the household. And it, you know the, the guys and men do other things. The women carry water, usually in jars or carry jars. And usually they carry on their head, right? That's one of the things you always see in the pictures. It's just a characteristic of the culture. So, huh. You know, this is kind of interesting, right? Jesus basically sends these guys out and says, okay, uh, you'll see a guy. And you know what they say, right, when he tells them that? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, sure, yeah. So we're, we're going to go to Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem's a big city. 
So we're going to go into Jerusalem and we'll see a, what, you can almost guess where they went and what gate they came through too. Which one do you think? Right? I think it's on the picture. Is it in the picture? No, it's not. Oh man, too bad. I should draw it in. Okay, here's, if, if here's the temple and here's the city of Jerusalem, I'm not going to draw it very well, but kind of like this, sort of like-ish. So this is the old city of David and the pool of Shiloak happens to be, uh, I think it's outside, it's like right here, but there is, this is the temple gate, and there's, I think it's also the fish gate, there's also another gate, there's a Gehenan gate that's in the Opal, in the old city of David, and then there's another gate right here, but a lot of people got their water from the pool of Shalak, it's one of the biggest pools there, and remember that's the one that the guys, that it was very, uh, uh, quiet pool because the water and originally it was a very vibrant pool because the water came through but over time it became the uh, the water supply became slightly blocked and so it was seeping in there but there was still plenty of water for the city but it was seeping it was no longer agitated so people waited around the pool to see the pool move the water pool move because they believed that then the power of God the hand of God the Ruach HaKodesh through angels was in the water. Remember, this was in other parts of the of the New Testament. Living water. And that is what they call living water, which I won't get into great detail, but that's what they poured onto the temple, onto the altar once a year. And so important, this was so important that Josephus tells us they, they ripped a priest to shreds. They ripped him limb to limb and killed him because they think they, they thought he missed the altar. He's supposed to pour the water from the pool of Shalak. It's it's a high point of the, um, uh, of the, uh, during the festival of booze, the end, the, uh, the, la the last day is the day of reconciliation. It's called, is it, not Rosh Hashanah, is it? It's, it's the last day of Yom Kippur. It's, it's the day of reconciliation. So the festival of booze, he's supposed to pour the, the water from the pool of stock, the living water on the, on the altar, and Josephus tells us it looked like he missed. He wasn't sure if he got it or not, and the people ripped him to shreds because that was the most one of the most important events of cleansing the altar. Okay, so anyway, people took this stuff seriously, you know, in that period. Um, in any case, there are a couple of gates they could come in, but the biggest gate, the easiest gate to come in, would be through there, which also. You know, if you look, there's kind of stealthy language in here. So he sent two disciples, tell them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet, will encounter you, and go in the same way with him. So they're kind of hanging around, and they see this guy. Well, do they see this guy? Let's see. Any case, they were likely in the old part of the city, which I kind of disagree with where they put, um, they have the upper room there. See where they, they put the higher upper room? I don't think it's quite there. I expect it was probably the old part of the city, but we'll see. Uh, say, okay, so they follow this guy. They stalk this guy as he goes to the house. They follow this guy with a jar. Say to the owner of the house, the oiko dospitis, the head of the family, literally. He enters, the house that he enters. The didaskalos, the teacher, didaskalos, that's Greek, legos. Where is my kataluma? Literally, my place to break up a journey. Where is my place to break up my journey? It's not, where is my guest room, as it says here. Where is the place to break up my journey? Where I may eat the Pasha, the Pasha sacrifice with my disciples. That's 14. This is odd in itself, right? If somebody came to your, imagine, if somebody stalked you to your house, right? Because it doesn't say they talked to this guy. They just encountered him. They saw him. Wasn't and, he in the way? What's that? Didn't you say he was in the way? <laughs> he, he was in the way. <laughs> Literally, they saw this guy with the jar, and they followed him to the house, and they go into the house, they go to the house, they go to the owner of the house, who's not the guy with the jar. Okay. Probably a slave with the jar. Probably a slave with the jar. Exactly right. Matter of fact, what's interesting about this, why is it interesting to have a slave that is a man with a jar? Because that's probably correct, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Probably for a cleansing. Well, no, it's just that 
most, okay, in the ancient world, we don't want to hear this. We should have been taught this. This is one of those things that, you know, you, they should have taught you back way a long time ago, at least in junior high, you think. In the ancient world, slavery existed. Slavery existed until about 1830s. In 1830, the first nation to ban slavery was the British. Britain banned slavery. The United States fought a huge war over it, and we banned slavery after that. They had not imported slaves from the 1830s anyway because the Brits didn't allow it. So slavery was a part of the world until at least the 1830s. Slavery was everywhere. In the ancient world, five, the, the population of Athens, five to one, was slaves over free people. And five to one, female to male. Most slaves were female because you didn't want male slaves expect, except digging trenches, you know, working on the farm. Why? Yeah, you don't want too many male slaves around there, so you kill them. Just kill them. Put them in the mines. They kill them. They did. They had them in the mines, right? The, their life wasn't very long. And, um, you know, Athens, Athens famous for what kind of mines? Mm -hmm. What's that? Huh? The rock, the quartz that they had. No, no, silver. Oh. As a matter of fact, that silver... The reason uh, Athens was such a powerhouse was because Lydia invented coinage in 600 BC, but who had the silver to make coinage? Athens. So gold was not a very high premium coinage until the Romans, really. There were some gold coins, but most coins were silver. And most of them, guess what, had an owl on them, because that was Athenian coinage, is the Athenian denari uh, denarius. So in any case, Athens was huge, and that's where you put your slaves. The male slaves was digging ditches and, you know, digging out the cesspools and digging, you know, for war and other kind of things. But in the cities, especially in the cities, almost every slave was a woman. So this guy had a male slave, which is very interesting. And what this indicated, well, think about what it indicates. It doesn't mean anything uh, salacious at all. What do you think it is? It is literally an act of kindness to have a male slave. And the male slave may have been a military slave. Because if you imagine, most slaves came out of warfare, especially male slaves. In warfare, when you captured, you know, in, at the end of the war, what we do is, is we repatriate them and put them in Guantanamo, or what we want to do, right? And then we send them back to do more terrorist acts. But in the ancient world, what they did is they either killed you dead, or they would take you as a slave. And usually they would take young people as slaves. And in the ancient world, although the Greeks, uh, you know, did not send warriors out to, who were young, they, you know, you had to be a seasoned warrior in the Greek culture. That's not true of almost every other culture. The Romans were very trading, but other cultures weren't like that. So, you know, they had children fighting the battlefields. Always had children fighting the battlefields. They may have been slaves too. But there's incredible compassion for a person, a man, to have a slave you know, in his household. It also could mean, could mean the guy was a eunuch. A lot of eunuch slaves, you know, created in that period. But anyway, that's probably enough of that, because it's really, the point that was important, isn't it interesting that the indicator was that a man would be carrying a jar, right? Now, how could Jesus know that? In any case. 15. He will show you a megas and a gaon. A megas Room above ground. Megas. Why do you need a megas? It's not, it, sa it says in here, a large upper room. But megas means big, big room, right? A big upper room, which is unusual, right? That is very unusual, especially in a city. So, first of all, a guy with a jar, probably a slave, carrying a jar, goes to a house and says, to that house. Now, how did Jesus know this? He's gone. Oh, wait, wait a second. Wait, okay, yeah, go back to we're, go back to chapters one through eight, right? A big festival with lots of people there. I mean, we don't make much of this, right? I mean, right? Yeah, he, he had his Wikipedia out, right? Or he had his thing, and he was able to check in the internet to find out what what places to go. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he will show you a mega upper room. Why did he need a mega upper room? Got a lot of throng. I gave it to you, right? There's not twelve. There's a throng. As a matter of fact, it says he'll show you a mega supper room that is stonumai, that's strong, that's furnished. 
So in other words, this large upper room is filled <coughs> with mats and things to sleep on. You ever seen, um, what's the way, Ben-Hur, right, Ben-Hur? Beautiful example. Remember that room that they're in? They're in an upper room, and the upper room has, like, uh, levels around it, and then it's strewn with mats and stuff. No furniture, just has pillows and mats and things on the floor. That's exactly what we're talking about. And make preparations for us there. Okay, so, 16. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared for the Passover. Now, I went to great detail last time, I'm not going to it, but you remember, you know, preparing for the Passover, they did not go to the supermarket, you know, the super Walmart, the super Target, and get their lamb. What did you have to do, quickly? The temple. You, well, you had to go to the temple, and remember, I told you before, why are always bunches of sheep or lambs in flocks in Bethlehem at this time of the year? That's right, and they were the approved ones. You couldn't just go get any lamb out of the marketplace and bring it because what would the Levite, what would the priest tell you? Where did you get it? Let me see your receipt. Right? This is worse than getting out of Best Buy or Sam's, right? Where they got to see your receipt. They would say, Where did you get it? Because this isn't an approved lamb. This is the way they're making their bucks. Because they had the lambs, and man, those lambs may have been really chewed up. It didn't matter, right? They came out of Bethlehem. And that's why the all the all the shepherds in Bethlehem were Levites. That's also why the Talmud says, guess when Jesus was probably born? In the spring during Passover. Because that's when you'll find shepherds and lambs in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means, Bethlehem is not a place where you usually take animals. What does it mean? Anybody remember what Bethlehem means? House of bread. Because they have lots of grain there. Not sheepies. Sheep are only in Bethlehem during that period. And so, in the Talmud, as a matter of fact, later on, the Jews added to it that a... I'll see if I can say this correctly. That a independent shepherd could no longer be at, could no longer be a witness for any court of law. Only a hired shepherd. Because what happened in Bethlehem that made shepherds so suspect, especially independent Levite shepherds. What did they do? Had patience. They went. They said incredible stuff. They went and said. Angels appeared to us and said the Messiah came and sang, or whatever they did. They, they harp. They didn't really sing, sing right? In the Greek. They, they just told us. And so what did they say? You guys are crazy. crazy. And so in the Talmud, if you are an independent shepherd, you cannot testify. It's specific in the Jewish law today. So I don't know if they have any situations like that, but, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> 17. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. The Jesus arrived with the doke, the two and ten. Two and ten. Yes. Okay. Guess what? Where were the other two that he sent? Preparing the Passover. They're preparing the Passover, right? So they weren't any of the, the twelve. They're not the twelve. Okay. Remember the crowd? Okay, they need a mega room. So Jesus arrived, and so did the other disciples, right? So now, but we know that there's a 12 too with him, see? While they were reclining, while they were anachimea, which means to recline is either a corpse or for a meal. Remember I told you the word changed? Isn't that funny that Mark gives us a different word? So the reclining is corpses or for a meal. <laughs> uh, at the table eating, and Jesus said, I lego you amen. I lego you, amen. I tell you the truth. One of you will paradidomai, will surrender me up, one who is eating with me. 19, they were saddened. They were lupeo, they were distressed. And one by one, they legoed to him. Legoed to him. So, 
You see what Mark is telling us? It, it says in the text, surely not I, right? But when it says Lego, what does that mean? They're arguing with him. They're, you know, so John says, oh, Jesus, I would never betray you because I'm beloved. And Peter says, Jesus, I would never betray you because, well, I'm not sure, but I would never betray you, right? And, and Andrew would say, Jesus, I would never betray you, right? So, they're, you know, each of them has his excuse, but that's what they say. So he's got the 12, and here's the picture. Okay, here's the room. They're in an upper room, a large upper room, and it's strewn with stuff. And so, you know, picture Jesus wherever they are, center, you know. They're all reclining around. The 12 are reclining probably close to Jesus. And then all around are the other disciples, right? In, in all these people, as many people have probably got the whole place filled up. So, and they're all eating lamb. They're all eating the Passover. And Jesus is probably going through the Passover. Do one of those, do a Seder yourself. We do a Seder almost every year. So do a Seder yourself and see what that's like. It's really neat. But 20, it is one of the 12, he replied. Okay, when he said that, what does that mean? If he says it is one of the 12. The rest of the throng is off the hook. Well, yeah, the rest of the throng is off the hook, but it also means what? Yeah, there's more people there. There's no reason for him to say it's one of the 12 if there's only 12, right? If there's only 12 guys around, I'll go, oh, it's one of you guys, right? But if there's a whole bunch of people there, I go, hey, it's one of you guys at this day, right? So obviously he's spoken to a whole bunch of people. And he says, one who in bapto wets, the bread is added, but one who dips wets into the tribulion, tribulion, the bowl with me. All right. What's the chance that, okay, you all right. First of all, how many dipping bowls do you think are with them? One or two, maybe. And maybe one or two, but how many are dipping and what are they dipping? No, bread is added. It doesn't say bread. What do you dip in the Seder? The herbs. The herbs, the parsley, the bitter herbs. In? Salt water. In salt water. And this is so beautiful. You have this little bowl, okay, and it's a bowl. And it's and so there's only one. I guarantee you there's only one. There's only one Seder thing for everybody. There, this may be for, I would suspect it's only for the people around this area. So each guy, this is a preparation. Each one had their own Seder, right? And so in the Seder, you take the herbs, the bitter herbs, which are usually parsley in the modern thing, and you dip it into the salt water. What does the salt water indicate? Tears. Tears. The tears. Yeah, the tears of the children of Israel. What do the bitter herbs represent? Suffering. It's not bread. He wasn't dipping bread. I know they added it into the in the mark in the Greek, but he ain't dipping bread. Okay? He's dipping, everybody is dipping into this bowl, and everyone is dipping after Jesus, all the twelve. Okay? And they're dipping bitter herbs into tears. Now, this is why in your translation they put bread. Because look what it says in 21. Uh, the Son of Man will go just as written about him, but woe to the man that betrays the Son of Man, and not betray, surrenders the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. This is relatively good translation. Do you notice what Jesus just did? He called himself the Son of Man. He saw himself the Son of Man. Before this, Jesus never called himself the Son of Man. Magically, after what? What happened that made him now call himself the Son of Man? He's been anointed. He's been anointed. He's anointed, therefore he will call himself the Son of Man. We'll see if he also calls himself Son of David, Christus, or God, and or God. Yeah? Just not to get too far off, but can we assume that one of the throngs <coughs> Yes. Matter of fact, I, I, see, here, this is a characteristic of Greek literature that, you know, 
in, in English literature, when your uh, biographer or your, your you know, writer is there, what do they want to always remind you of? They're there. I'm here. Look, me. I'm Mark, right? In the ancient world, what did they do? Never. You did not mention yourself. Even in, like, for example, uh, Paul and Luke, when Paul is writing about, or Luke is writing about Paul, or when Paul is writing about himself in all the letters, he pretty much ignores himself. Very rarely does he actually talk about himself. You know, that's why it's so rare to get information about the authors, is because in Greek text, it was considered a bad taste or whatever. Even biographies, you know, biographies, nobody wrote biographies or autobiographies. You know, you just didn't do that. In the ancient world, it was just considered crafts, right? You didn't mention yourself. And so, you know, now I think Paul uh, may be in some of these, not necessarily in this six circumstance, but he may have been hanging, right? He never mentions it on purpose in any of his writings because it's embarrassing to him. Mark was probably here. There's no reason for him to mention it because he's not, Mac. we think Mark, um, well, later on we'll see where Mark may be. He's the guy that runs away uh, half naked. Because he gets his cloak taken off. Yes. Yeah. Maybe this was Mark's house because then they meet there later. I mean, Mark's, Mark, that became kind of a center in his, his mother's house or whatever. I don't know. We'll have to get back to that. I, I don't think so. I think this was a <coughs> highly unusual. I also do uh, like there is a potential for military connection here. And, you know, why these guys had a large upper room? Well, why do you think? What would a military guy do with a large upper room in Jerusalem? Well, place for meeting, right? So if this guy is part of the Essenes. Remember, you have the Essenes and Zealots? And the Essenes are not really militarized, but the Zealots are. This guy could be a... a, a and why would a guy have a male slave? Right? I mean, who has male slaves? Think about it. Did Caesar have male slaves? Yeah. Did Marcus Aurelius have male slaves? Why? Why do you have male slaves? If you're, what? Soldiers. Yeah. Well, not only are they soldiers. Bodyguard. Well, yeah, your bodyguard. Yeah, you take a guy. You take a guy that was a great soldier, <coughs> and you convert them. Uh, I don't want to talk about how they convert them in the ancient world, but you convert them either through, you know, you can not eunuchizing them or like threatening them in horrible ways, right? You, they, they basically came to your side. They're threatened, and they become. They decide to become part, and they're basically tested. But if you're a military guy, you know, you want your butler, right? Your butler watches your back, you know, takes off your armor, puts it back on, you know. This was the way of the world until what? <coughs> Who changed this world view? Huh? Who changed this world view in the world about military stuff? Christianity. In Christianity, who was your arms bearer in Christianity? Comes out of the Baida Saxon uh, in the European culture, but you never would trust a slave to do that kind of that thing. And so in the Christian culture, a lot of slavery left military, the military because of lack of trust, number one, but also the military system under Christianity was that you would have the pages, remember the pages and the squires and the knights. And so the pages and squires were, were in other words, in the ancient world, who were the knights? Who were the guys that were the military dudes? The wealthy and powerful. The wealthy and powerful. And if and if if your dad was a knight or your dad was military, you know the Romans changed this pretty radically because in the in the legions, mm -hmm. and so did the Greeks. The Greeks, everybody, you know, well, all free people were all free men were in their military, right? But the Romans, you had to be a Roman citizen. It was the select of the culture, and that was started to change. Guess what? Christianity pushed that further and further. So in, when you get later on in the Christian element of the Christian world in the medieval era, it's now who can become? Not quite everyone. You still had to be at first of nobility, right? 
But you can advance through the ranks and earn your knighthood. You could advance through the ranks and earn your knighthood. It wasn't something that was just given because you were. So we're beginning. Look, it, look. These cultural things. People think what? We suddenly invent fraternity, egalitarian, and whatever, right? Freedom and, and all that stuff. So we suddenly invent them. No. These things take decades, take hundreds and thousands of years to develop in, in the human mind, right? The idea that you could earn, you know, that, that you could, well, today, what we call the American dream, right? You, you can be like my father and be a, a you know, a, a dirt farmer, you know, on a, on a borrowed piece of land, and you could advance in the ranks to become a pilot in the U.S. Air Force. What a cool idea. And this was the beginning of that idea. It's no longer slaves and masters. It's no longer, you know, it, it slowly evolves over time. And we get to the point where, you know, we have this ability or freedom that based on your abilities that you would be promoted or whatever. So anyway, I, I think this is really important, but I, I like this military view. The reason they, were, they might have had a room was because if they were Essenes or Zealots, they were planning attacks against Romans and would also provide a great place for doing this surreptitiously, right? I mean, this is part of that sneakiness that why the disciples were, you know, Jesus didn't say go into town and start saying, hey, anybody got a big room? Hey, hey, is there a place we can, right? Got reservations for a thousand. Yeah, yeah got reservations for lots of folks, right? And plus, you know, this would also be... Uh, well, they didn't have NSA, so they weren't monitoring their cell phones. But you, you think about this. This is, you know, although the, there are lots of people coming into the city for Passover. Which so they already filled the city, which means there's no rooms. And they're kind of under the radar scope. So anyway, I, I talk about this a lot. Anyway, look, this is where they get it, where we get it. Okay, and while they were eating, Jesus Lambano took bread, a loaf. Oh, and this is really interesting, because the word that's used... Artos, a loaf in, in Greek. Anybody know what an artos is? Well, it's not bread like us. Our bread is it? I mean, it's like, isn't this like what they would have at the store? More like a cracker? It's the, it's the, yeah, the masa bread. Well, see, it doesn't say unleavened. Oh. The word artos means, generally in Greek, a loaf of leavened bread. I'm just saying, you know. Because if it were a seder, they would not have leaven. If it, yeah, if it was a, if it was a true seder, you know, it is the feast of unleavened bread, and it says that specifically in Mark. But what's really funny is it doesn't say. Now, I give it the benefit of the doubt. It could be one or the other. But I'm just saying it's very interesting in the Greek. Greek is usually very concrete. Greek usually tells us it's leaven, it's not leaven. It's a raised bread, it's not raised bread. In this case, they give us a word that is not really that ambiguous. It means raised bread. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't know what to take from this exactly, but the, while they were eating Jesus, Lambano, Artos, and Ulego, Ulego, spake, spake well of it, gave thanks, blessing, and broke it, Cleo, break the bread, and he gave it to his... It doesn't say disciples, but it says autos. So it gave it around and said, take, this is my soma, not my sarks. Okay, now, this is where lots of people get this all messed up. Sarks is the physical flesh. Uh, tsuke is the thoughts. And panuma is the soul, or the you know, spirit, we say. This all goes to the soma. And Jesus says, take it, this is my soma. In other words, it represents everything. Not just flesh, not just suke, not just panuma, but everything. See, lots of people say, well, those, those crazy Christians, they're cannibals. they're cannibals eating Jesus, right? But the Greeks well knew what they were eating. They weren't eating the physical sarks. If Jesus meant you're eating my flesh, he would have said sarks. If he said you're eating a representation of my mind, he would have said suke. If he meant you're eating 
a representation of my spirit, he would have said Penuma. But he didn't. He said Soma in Mark, which means specifically everything. You're, you're, it's, and by the way, you can't be in his flesh, I mean his physical him, right? Because you're, he's right there. See? But it's really interesting that he took an artos. I don't know exactly what that means, and I'm not going to say it was leavened or unleavened. I'm just saying there is some question. 23, he took Lambano the cup, the prot uh, poterion, the drinking vessel, gave thanks, literally a Eucharisto. Before he gave for the bread, oh, and I should tell you what he said. He probably said this. He, the eulego is probably, blessed be he king of creation who brings wheat from the ground. That's the eulego for the bread, generally. Because, well, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you the background behind this in, sec in a second. Okay, and by the way, it says the disciples, so it doesn't say 12. 12. It was everybody. It was everybody. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. And this time it's a Eucharisto. It's a Eucharisto. So he gave a grateful thanks. Very different, different thing than the Eulego. The Eucharisto is probably, blessed be he, king of creation, who brings fruit of the vine from the earth. And he offered to them, they all imbibed from it. They imbibed from it. You know, we say it drank, but it says in the Greek, they imbibed. In other words, they took a big slug of it, right? This was, let's say what this is. I have, a, if, you read the, if you read the Greek New Testament, or the uh, Jewish New Testament, I think it has an excellent e explanation of this. Um, I don't think there's enough indications in Mark to tell us exactly what was going on. There are more indications in the other Gospels, so you might want to look at them. But specifically, this was probably uh, the cup of Isaiah, which is the cup that was reserved for Isaiah during the meal. Every Jewish Seder, they took a cup and poured it for Isaiah. And that was for the Messiah. So when Isaiah came, he would be able to participate in the Seder. They also took the matzah, the bread, and they separated it into three parts. The one part they ate at the supper, one part they hid. It's called the hidden matzah, and the children would go looking for it. The third part was the reserve, and they would put that away because that was reserved for Elisha, Elisha when the Messiah came. So in the age of the Messiah, the Messiah would come take the cup of the Messiah, and he would take the reserve. Guess what we call our sacrament? We don't really, well, we do do reserve sacrament, but Anglicans, Catholics do reserve sacrament. It's called reserve. It's reserve sacrament. It's unleavened bread that is reserved for communion. So in the minds of many uh, Messianic Jews, that when Jesus did this Seder, he took the cup of Ezekiel because he was the Messiah. Now, why would Mark not need to tell us this? standing there watching him. They all knew, right? If, if, okay, if you were, let's say you're a Greek convert to Christianity in that time, to the way, right, to Teen Hodos, what have you learned? You learned everything that a Jewish believer would know. Yeah, and you're doing it. Because what did they do every, what did they do for their Eucharist? What did they do for their communion? They had a meal. They had a Seder. And in the Seder, they had lamb. And if you were if you were pro-Paul, you had lamb that was sacrificed, and it didn't matter where it came from, you didn't ask questions, right? If you were anti-Paul, you had lamb that was from the temple unless you left lived someplace else, and then you didn't have any lamb at all. Right? But every time you had a Seder, and guess what they did? They would take the reserve down in the church and they would present that to you that was the bread and they would take and by the way during that ceremony the seder that you did the communion you would be doing a seder so you'd be dipping the salt water and the bitter herbs just like the disciples and jesus talked about you would be doing it you would be doing all these things Unfortunately, 
John Christophel came around in the third century, and John Christophel made our mass. And I blessed John Christophel, but he was an anti-Paulian. So guess what? That's why you don't have lamb in the Eucharist. Where every other Christian until, well, not every other Christian, all the Paulians had lamb. At least if it didn't upset your brother, right? So nobody asked, where did the lamb come from? <laughs> where did you buy this lamb? Marketplace, marketplace, you know? Yeah, yeah. Kosher, kosher butcher, kosher butcher. So the, tr the trick is that everybody knew this. See, everybody that is, is hearing this, because they're going to do it, right? When they're reading Mark, guess what they're about to do? They're going to have a Seder. And they, I don't know how they did it exactly. I suspect they did it just like the Jewish guys did it. Exactly, right? The way we do our Seder at home when we do our little Seder, it only takes a couple of seconds, right? You have some boiled eggs, you have some you know, dip, and you, you, know, you ask the questions, right? And then you eat a little lamb, and then you have the added part that Jesus added. That, by the way, is in the um, didache. The didache tells you how to do it. And guess what? How did the didache tell you how to do it? Anybody remember? Wine first, and then bread. Guess what the Jews did? Wine first, and then bread. We do it backwards, and it's really interesting that it's done backwards, and probably, well, I don't know exactly. Anybody have a guess why, maybe? I know it's cultural. It's the priest drank the wine. Well, but why did Mark, you see, maybe, you know, Jesus probably did it that way, but, you know. The Catholic Church drinks the wine and not the congregation. Well, it depends. They, that's that's old. That's old. That's not Vatican II, and that's not the way they 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 did it after Martin down. Luther took them to, you know, beat them with a stick. But anyway, um, but the thing is that in the Greek culture, you know, why would Mark, you know, now if Mark was there and Jesus did it the opposite way, but I'm just saying the didache has it the what the the wine first and then the bread, and the and the Hebrews did it, wine and bread. I don't know. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? But if Jesus did it backwards, why did he do it backwards? And uh, it's it just it's an interesting thought, right? Why did he not follow general Hebraic protocol? So I'll leave you with that thought. We'll continue on uh, next week from here. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray, Amen. Two weeks. Two weeks, two weeks, sorry, two weeks. I'll be in Paris. I'll be thinking of you. In gay Paris.